the Breaking Harvey session. This is ecological and remote sensing perspectives of the 2017 Atlantic hurricane season. Thank you all for being here. We're gonna go ahead and get started. So our first talk is from Dr. Sobel, and she will be discussing using satellite imagery to quantify water quality impacts and recovery from Hurricane Harvey. Uh, good afternoon, thank you for having me. Um, I'm a PhD student actually at University of Houston. Um, and I'm gonna give a little background on Hurricane Harvey, some of the field sampling that we've done, and um, just generally uh, field sampling for water quality. And then I'll jump into our methodology and results and then jump back to methodology for a moment and going back to more results. So I live uh, in Houston, Texas. And between the 25th and 31st of August this year, um, we got between 25 and 50 inches of rain. So you can see in almost the entire city that resulted in flooding of at least the 100 year flood levels. And then you can also see that big pollutant load um, carrying a lot of suspended solids and potentially industrial waste because we have a large petrochemical complex. And it carries it into the Galveston Bay estuary system and then out into the Gulf of Mexico. So uh, I study environmental engineering, and we do a lot of field sampling in my group. So we were out there on the same day that image was taken collecting field samples. Um, but we were also competing for resources. As you can see in these pictures, uh, there are people you know, getting evacuated from their homes, folks trying to get access to their homes, and some news crews. So we almost got to go out on the boat, but then we got bumped by the CNN news crew. Um, so we had to go navigate around to other parts of the city dealing with flooded areas and traffic. We were able to get to about seven sites on that day, um, but field sampling in general is a pretty resource intensive process. It is, um, says its own safety risks and the resolution that you're getting is really gonna be confined by your access. And then when we have extreme events like this, all of those problems are exacerbated. So our objective with this work was to remotely sense and quantify water quality um, over time due to Hurricane Harvey. So specifically, we're aiming to quantify total suspended solids. So that includes your sand, silt, and clay sediments. It also can include um, decaying plant and animal matter, industrial waste, all those sort of things. And um, it's interesting because it's really defined more by the analytical method rather than the other way around. TSS represents the dried solids that um, stay on a 0.45 micron filter after fil filtering a known volume of sample. And this is also a bit of a laborious task because you've got a few cycles of filtering and drying. Another reason we want to be able to remotely assess this stuff. And typical concentrations are going to be below 30 milligrams per liter in some clean water. So in addition to those pollutant loads, why do we care about TSS? It can harm aquatic life in concentrations as low as 10 milligrams per liter and affect most fish species up to like 80 and 100 milligrams per liter. It reduces photosynthesis in the water column, reduces clarity, it's not very nice to look at. It also increases water temperature and adds um, oxygen demand. So in order to uh, assess this stuff remotely, we need to get some satellite imagery. We chose Sentinel-2 for this purpose, launched in 2015. Um, we are focusing on the high resolution, visible and near infrared bands, and in our area it's actually at a 10 day revisit frequency. And we coordinated this with the um, state of Texas surface water quality monitoring system, and they've got over 2300 measurements of TSS between 2000 and to the present, present excuse me, and um, it's a bit of a turbid bay system, so our mean concentration is 30 milligrams per liter, and it has gotten up to 130 milligrams per liter in the past, and this shows you sort of a sample day when there was rain, a couple inches of rain, um, about a week and a half prior, and then this is comparing to that first day after Harvey, but you can see that there is a clear spectral response um, in, the, in the visible. So to work with the satellite imagery, we've got to do a little bit of processing. We converted top of atmosphere to bottom of atmosphere reflectance. And then for our purposes, we're really only interested in water pixels. Um, so we use the same sen 2 core processor that converts to bottom of atmosphere. They also provide uh, a water mask. So then we were extract, able to extract only water pixels. There are challenges specifically with um, cloud shadows. We looked at a couple of other water algorithms and. Um, this one did perform the best. So after getting 
those water pixels, we can extract um, information around the water quality monitoring stations. So we did that by just getting the mean reflectance within a 20 meter buffer applied around each of the stations of interest. So what that produced was um, during the, from the time of Sentinel launch, we had a data set of 261 data points, and then we allowed up to three days between um, Sentinel scene capture and sample collection, as long as there wasn't any rainfall. So that gave us 46 data points across 35 stations, eight Sentinel scenes from um, 2016 to the summer of this year. And the conditions of, those t of the TSS concentrations were pretty comparable to the historical record. And we looked at those, their correlations of uh, remotely sensed reflectance with our TSS values and the visible infrared. We also looked at some band ratios. And the goal was to get um, a really simple one or two band regression. Um, we did that with uh, minimizing error using stepwise linear regression. And so our result was uh, two band regression with the red and the near infrared. And we split our data set into calibration and validation. We had 34 calibration points, 12 validation points, and made sure that those were just, just um, excuse me, distributed across space, year, season, concentration. And we got some nice um, results for each of those. Uh, root mean squared errors of two and three milligrams per liter for each, and uh, respectively an R squared of 0.74 and 0.76. So now we get to actually apply this regression. But before I show you that, I want to give you a little hydrologic context. So we chose Sentinel really because it got some great cloud-free imagery um, at really critical times in the storm. So we got a nice image three days before the storm. We had a nice cloud-free image one day after the storm, 10, 11 days after the storm, and then uh, 31 days after the storm. And you can see they've got eight uh, discharge and gauge height, uh, gauge height, water surface elevation gauges, excuse me. And you can look at the conditions during each of those days. So before the storm, it was really low, um, either base flows or no flow at all. And then what's most interesting is um, this condition, the September 1st, is really still some pretty elevated hydrology in most cases, even peak in a couple of cases. So we're capturing a critical um, hydrologic moment on that day. And then of course the other two days you can see a really return to normal conditions. Uh, the other thing I'll point out is um, this was a really a rainfall driven event more than a surge driven event, so we don't have a huge peak at the outlet of the bay. So now we can look at some of the more interesting fun results. So this is TSS before the storm. Um, good water quality. We're below, the peak was like 26 milligrams per liter, so really nice good water quality. And here's that one day after the storm. We got up to 175 milligrams per liter. So if you'll remember, the fish are gonna be impacted at like 80 milligrams per liter. So they're gonna be really, really stressed in this type of situation. And on top of that, this is all fresh water coming in and this is a saltwater estuary, of course, so that's additional stress on those aquatic life. And then the other thing that I'll point out is there is a lot of solids export directly to the Gulf of Mexico. Flows were still really, really high at this point, so we don't expect a lot of deposition in the bay. Now, 11 days after the storm, we still have elevated concentrations. The peak was 88 milligrams per liter, um, but a couple of things, you'll notice that there isn't export happening in the bay at this point, and we saw that the hydrology had really returned to normal, so a lot of this sediment we do expect to deposit in the bay. And then 31 days later, conditions have really returned back to normal, um, back to, to pre-Harvey solids levels. So jumping back into a little methodology we can look at, um, we can combine bathymetry with water surface elevation that was captured at the time that the sentinel scenes were captured, and that'll give us estimates, wrong direction, of water volume and 200 meter resolution. And if, then if we combine that um, with our predicted TSS concentrations at the 10 meter resolution, we can get estimates now of solid mass at a 10 meter resolution. So it looks pretty similar uh, to what you would expect. Uh, it's pretty similar to the TSS. Galveston Bay is a pretty shallow estuary. It's less than three meters, uh, with the exception of our navigable ship channel, which you can see the sediment mass is sort of tracing that ship channel. And what's probably more compelling about this is from these estimates, we can now estimate the total solids mass that's within the bay. 
So if we look at that, I'll just first show the water volume estimates. And because it wasn't surge driven, there isn't a tremendous increase in water volume over these different days. But then when we look at the total solids mass, we see there's a big difference, about 630% higher directly after the storm than pre-Harvey conditions. And then it's not even dropped by half 11 days later. And then by 31 days, things are sort of back to normal. And then to give a little bit of um, comparison of that, that value is equivalent to just over 200,000 uh, US tons. And so the Mississippi River, for example, releases about 220,000 tons every day into the Gulf of Mexico. And the drainage area of Galveston Bay is like less than one half of 1% of the Mississippi River's drainage area. So to summarize, um, we think that satellite imagery is really well suited um, for quantifying water quality in inland waters, especially during these extreme events. Um, it was also useful in understanding some of these uh, suspended solids transport and kind of finding those times when we're switching from advection dominated conditions to depositional. And we're going to use this to inform some future sampling methods or sampling um, campaigns and incorporate some other field data and flow data to better understand the system and the water quality response during this storm and also look at um, how smaller storms are responding now after Hurricane Harvey and see if there's a difference in those. So with that, I'll say thank you and answer any questions. We have time for about one question. Okay, well, thank you so much. All right. And could Kumar please come up? All right. Uh, good afternoon, all. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Avishek Kumar. Uh, I am a third-year PhD student at University of Georgia. Uh, I am here to present one of our recent NASA developed uh, project on behalf of my team member, which is related to recent Hurricane uh, Irma impact on mangrove forest in Biscayne Bay National Park in Florida. Uh, as the topic suggests, the, we utilize NASA Earth observation, but as I will proceed towards my presentation, you will see some of other Earth observation uh, data as well in this project. So first of all, why do we care about mangroves? Uh, because they are uh, most economically and uh, ecologically important ecosystem around the world. They not only supports the uh, <coughs> fisheries uh, uh, around the coastal communities, but they also reduce the storm surges and protect the uh, coastal uh, erosions as well as, uh, 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 apart from that, they also act uh, as an effective carbon sequester and play an important role in overall carbon budget. And here are some numbers which uh, 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 I gathered from uh, the Nature Conservancy and you can see like uh, the mangroves near uh, Florida, it contributes around $1 billion to recreational fishing uh, around uh, the coastal region, as well as not only in Florida, but it also uh, contributes uh, uh, significantly uh, to millions of people uh, through the uh, fish factories. However, the, these kind of storms like Hurricane uh, Irma happened recently, they affect not only the spatial extent of mangrove system, but they also uh, affect the other ecosystem which depends on these mangrove system surrounding that area. And that creates a com uh, kind of concern among the communities who are living uh, around uh, those mangroves area. And every developed project starts with this 
kind of community concerns where we propose some kind of ideas to our uh, uh, other government agencies uh, who use our end products to solve uh, this kind of issues. So for this project, we partner with uh, the city of Miami Beach Public Works Department uh, to support their resiliency uh, effort. Uh, the city of Miami Beach Public Works Department, they are uh, working on reducing the storm water runoff uh, mitigation effect and uh, the pumping station, uh, the other pumping station. And uh, for this project, uh, we focused around uh, the Miami-Dade County. Uh, the entire project was uh, based on Miami-Dade County. However, for uh, this uh, case study of hurricane, we only focused around this coastal uh, part of Biscayne Bay mangroves and here the key Biscayne area. Uh, and our study uh, period included from 1984 to 2017. So there were two major objectives for this project. First was to assess the extent and health of uh, the coastal wetlands near uh, Miami uh, Dade County uh, during and after Hurricane Irma, as well as uh, the historical uh, Hurricane Andrew using multiple satellite products. The second objective was to examine the coastal damage uh, in Miami Beach following Hurricane Irma using high resolution planet scope data, which we were not able to do with uh, the uh, course resolution of the other satellite uh, data which we incorporated in the study. And on the right side, uh, you can see the track of both cyclone. So Hurricane uh, Andrew uh, made the landfall from the east side uh, to the south Florida. And uh, when it made the landfall, it was category four hurricane. Uh, and you can see the wind speed uh, of each type, uh, cat each category hurricane uh, at the bottom of the scale. However, when the hurricane Irma made landfall, uh, it was uh, uh, near our study area, the, it uh, reduced to category two storm. So we expected the uh, impact of hurricane uh, uh, Andrew should be uh, more as compared to hurricane Irma. And here you can see the, uh, all the Earth observation satellite we included in this study. So for historical analysis, we used Landsat 5 thematic mapper surface reflectance product. And for recent analysis, we used the operational uh, other satellite sensor, including Landsat 8, Landsat 7, and Sentinel-2 uh, data. We used Landsat 7 still uh, because even if there is scanline uh, error issue with the uh, sensor, but we did not have any cloud-free data from the Landsat 8 post Hurricane Irma. That's why we have to include even Landsat 7. So here is the method flowchart for how we proceed towards our objective. So first of all, we downloaded all the Landsat uh, data. Here uh, we are missing the Landsat 7 in the flowchart, but it was also there, Landsat 5, Landsat 7, and Landsat 8. And then we implemented this gross primary productivity model, which we recently published in PNAS and produced uh, the pre and post hurricane spatial map of gross primary productivity, which is the indicator of mangroves health, uh, how they convert the photosynthetically active ready, uh, available light to the uh, organic uh, compound. However, we lack the Sentinel-2 based uh, the uh, gross primary productivity model. Therefore, we only use normalized different uh, vegetation index to create the maps and try to see how it was uh, uh, matching with the Landsat based uh, 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 final products. And uh, the planet scope uh, data were only used for classification purpose so that we can assess the coastal damage pre and uh, post Hurricane Irma and try to assess the how long it took to recover uh, the uh, uh, those affected areas. So first of all, what we did is uh, we try to look, uh, uh, we try to do some qualitative assessment. So. Uh, you can see uh, on the right side, uh, this is the true color images uh, uh, near the, our study area from here, uh, from Landsat 8. 
and you can clearly see the green color uh, of the mangrove forest uh, before Hurricane Irma. So Hurricane Irma made landfall uh, around our study area on September 10, and this image is from September 7. And post Hurricane Irma, we do not have any landsat data, so we used the Sentinel-2 data, and you can clearly see the brown color uh, from uh, the green color transformed to hair brown color in the Sentinel-2 images. Uh, but it was hard to tell from just the true color images what those brown color means actually. So we tried to uh, look for some uh, aerial imageries from the NOAA website and try to zoom around those brown, brown color areas and you can clearly see the fallen mangrove trees around these areas uh, and some of the trees were completely uprooted even uh, in these zoomed uh, aerial imageries we found. But even if there, if there is a hurricane, we know that there will be definitely uprooting of the trees is going to happen. But how uh, we can evaluate like uh, some of the biophysical parameter, that was the question for uh, this project. So here you can see the gross primary productivity map which uh, we produced after implementing the uh, gross primary productivity model. And you can clearly see, see the uh, reduction in Landsat 7 uh, image, which was uh, taken post Irma. So before Hurricane uh, Irma, the median value of gross primary productivity was around 0 0.037 kg carbon per meter square, which reduced to 0 0.03 kg carbon per meter square just after Irma. And when we tried to look the image uh, after two months of the uh, landfall of Irma, we started to see the recovery in gross primary productivity and it came back to 0 0.037 kg carbon per meter square. However, the extent did not recover fully. It was 22 kilometers square before Hurricane Irma and now it was like 20, uh, 19 kilometers square. And same effect we saw in the upper part of the Biscayne Bay as well. You can see the uh, gross primary productivity reduce here as well. But that was from Landsat. So uh, we tried to see uh, from the Sentinel, which has like so just after Irma, because Sentinel has now two sensors. One is Sentinel 2A and Sentinel 2B. So we were able to get uh, uh, data just before Irma and just before, uh, just after Irma from Sentinel 2A and Sentinel 2B. And you can clearly see the in NDVI map, it uh, matched with, uh, it saw the agreement with the Landsat results as well. And uh, after two months, uh, again, the Sentinel-2 NDVI map started showing the recovery. So uh, it showed the clear agreement between Landsat and Sentinel-2 results. And then we tried to see how uh, this was, uh, how uh, uh, the recovery process was during Hurricane Andrew. We go went back into the past with the Landsat-5 imageries. And you can see the comparison was uh, uh, done between the, from the same months uh, of the December so that there is no seasonal bias in our comparison. So we can clearly see before the Hurricane Andrew how the mangrove extent was, it was around uh, 17 kilometer square, which reduced to 6 kilometer square uh, after uh, the Hurricane Andrew made landfall. And it took almost three years to recover back to the same uh, extent. Uh, so it was quite longer time to recover the extent during Hurricane Andrew. And even in the gross prime productivity, we saw the reduction. And here is the coastal damage uh, we uh, assessed using the planet scope uh, three meter uh, spatial resolution data. You can, uh, here is the false color composite before uh, Irma and here is false color composite image uh, post Irma where the red color represents the vegetation. Uh, you can clearly see the damaged area uh, after Hurricane Irma. And what we found is like approximately 45% of coastal vegetation uh, uh, along Miami Beach was lost or damaged after Hurricane Irma. And, uh, when we analyzed the image after 40 days, we saw the recovery uh, of 26% of vegetation. Uh, so coming to the conclusion, uh, 
what we found is uh, impact of Hurricane Andrew was more severe as compared to Hurricane Irma uh, using uh, on the aerial extent of the mangroves. And uh, uh, mangrove uh, uh, exhibit resiliency both in uh, hurricane and non-hurricane years. What is the take home message is like using the, this multi-sensor approach that is important where the currently state of art is going not, not only in this field but in other field as well because every sensor has their own advantages and we try to leverage advantage of each sensor during hurricane season optical sensor always face that kind of like cloud issue so if there is like kind of cross calibration approach is implemented then uh, we can have more increased temporal uh, uh, re uh, resolution and we can assess the damage area more frequently with that, I would like to acknowledge our project partners, uh, Francisco D'Elia and Bruce Mori, both from City of Miami Beach. And uh, I would also like to thank my advisor, uh, Dr. Deepak Mishra from University of Georgia, who always encouraged me to do this kind of time-sensitive uh, time uh, project uh, analysis. And with that, if you have some questions, thank you so much. Um, we have time for a question while our next speaker comes up and gets ready. John Kossuth. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is John Kossuth. And he will be speaking about real-time new satellite product demonstration for microwave sensors and GO16 and NL NRLTC web. I just need to get to your dock. You have a macro PC. Great. Okay. Thank you. Echo. All right, um, so I'm gonna discuss um, some of the new satellite products that we have that we produce in near real time for um, forecasters at the Naval Research Lab Tropical Cyclone webpage. And in particular, I'm gonna focus on GOES-16, which just launched in uh, November of last year, and some new microwave sensor research we do. I'd like to thank my um, uh, coworkers and uh, the satellite analysis team at the Naval Research Laboratory as well. So my outline is I'm just going to briefly uh, talk about uh, our web page where you can see all of these products in near real time. Um, then I'm going to go into some of the GO16 visible and infrared products and then uh, move on to the microwave products. So uh, the main reason we do this analysis is to help hurricane forecasters. And so um, we have a web page. We also deliver these products directly to forecasters at the National Hurricane Center and Joint Typhoon Warning Center. And um, what we're trying to do is help improve the forecast environment to be able to better understand how the storm is currently uh, doing and then how it's going to evolve in the near term. And so this is just kind of an outline of where you can look at these products. We have the website here where you can look at them not only in real time, but look over the past 20 years of archive data that we've created. Okay, so uh, to begin with, I want to point out what's, how we've improved with the new GO16, which just launched. Uh, in previous years, over the past, let's say, 15, 20 years, we've been able to look at five different channels in GOES. We have a, a visible, uh, near-infrared, and a few infrared-type channels. With GOES uh, 16, what we've been able to do is, is move beyond uh, this simple visible and uh, water vapor infrared to uh, a whole expanded suite of being able to analyze different radiative properties of the Earth. And so um, what we're going to do is look at uh, not only what we can uh, see with the different visible channels, but the, how we expand our water vapor, understanding of water vapor uh, vertically in the atmosphere, as well as um, being able to dissect cloud properties and heights. Uh, what I also want to mention is we can do this with uh, Himbawari, which is in the Western Pacific over Japan, these exact same channels. But the one thing that goes, uh, has that Himbawari does not is this cirrus band, and I'll point that out, uh, what we can do with that in a little bit. Okay, so uh, I'm not going to talk too much about the high resolution or the high temporal frequency, but I did want to just give you an idea of what that can 
do for us. This is a uh, satellite loop of Hurricane Irma, uh, just as it was approaching the Lesser Antilles. And what we can see is a whole bunch of different structures. Uh, we can see inside the eye different mesovortices. We see gravity waves uh, expanding outward from the uh, convective center of the storm. We see transverse banding, uh, these uh, parallel uh, lines that are extruding from the storm. And this is just uh, using the full disk 15 minutely data. Um, the Gozar has the capability of doing this every 30 seconds. And so we have unprecedented ability to visualize some of these structures. Uh, I highly recommend visiting some of our partner websites at University of Wisconsin or CIRA if you're interested in seeing what kind of detail uh, we can resolve with these higher temporal and spatial resolutions. What I want to do is focus on some of the spectral characteristics. And so um, just starting with some channel that everybody's familiar with, this is the visible channel. It's known as the red band because it's near the red part of the spectrum. And um, this is a very easy channel to describe because it's intuitive. What you're just looking at is the reflected light from the clouds coming back at you. And so it's useful for all meteorological analyses of looking at clouds, snow, or ice on the ground, um, fog, uh, any, any sort of thing that's reflected off during the day. And this is available at a half kilometer resolution. Something we're able to do with, Go, with this new GOES series is to be able to discriminate uh, low versus high cloud. And so what this product does is it adds not only that red band that I described, but a, a vegetative band and an infrared to be able to distinguish low clouds, which are in yellow, thick clouds, which are white, and then the hot, thin high cirrus in blue. And it's also easier to distinguish land in green and ocean in blue. So um, what this does is it's been ported from the NOAA AVHRR program, and we adapted this to more easily look at um, vertical cloud placement. Now what I want to show you is um, when we add some of our own new product to look at the cirrus, look how extensive the cirrus is throughout the entire Gulf of Mexico. This product uses the cirrus channel as well as the visible channel and um, the description of what you can see in it is shown to the right. And this is a test product that we've been demoing uh, this season to demonstrate the extent of how much undetected thin cirrus there is throughout all the clear skies we've seen before. And so here's a comparison of the animation that really strikes home about how much cirrus there is literally everywhere. Um, and so leveraging this new Gozart uh, capability, we're able to see that. And um, what's really important is that because we have cirrus everywhere, that really affects all of our retrievals of land or surface underneath it because now we're biased by underrepresenting the radiative impact of that cirrus cloud. And so this is the type of analysis that uh, we'd like to expand upon as we move forward. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time going through all the different channels, but what I want to do show is the, how we're better able to look at the water vapor in the atmosphere as well. So this is um, the 6.2 micron channel looking at clouds that are above, say, about 350 hectopascals, and then around 350 hectopascals, what we're looking at is the water vapor emission. And so with this new GOES technology, we can look at um, water vapor not only at the upper levels, but through the mid-troposphere as well to get a better sense of how does the um, water vapor content and air mass change and evolve through time. So the difficult thing that you'll notice is that as we move through the atmosphere, this is the same color table, but you notice the color's changing. As we move down in the atmosphere, we're getting um, warmer and warmer brightness temperatures. So it's hard to compare, intercompare how much water vapor there is between them, but we can see relative differences between the channels. And so by doing an analysis of this, it allows a vertical assessment of where dry and moist air masses are, cyclones, jets, deformation patterns, etc. Okay, so I'm going to segue into um, now what can we use in tandem with microwave imagery. And so for those that aren't as familiar with how to interpret microwave imagery, I just wanted to do a quick primer. On the left is infrared, and so we know that what that is, that's looking at the cloud tops. The colder the temperature, the colder and deeper the cloud top. And on the right is a microwave image close to the same time. And so while we're looking at the cloud tops in Hurricane Maria on the left, over here on the right, we could see through the cloud tops in the series and looking at the microphysics, the ice and the liquid water inside of it. We're seeing the hydrometeor characteristics. And so depending on what frequency we're looking at, this one happens to be 89 gigahertz, we could observe different um, hydrometeor characteristics in the atmosphere. So we could see liquid water, ice, water vapor, etc. And so, um, Looking at the two that are most currently used in operational forecasting, 37 gigahertz looks at a lot of the liquid water, 89 looks at the ice. 
And so when we're looking at um, how to interpret this, ice scatters brightness, temperatures, and radiation from beneath it. And so we're going to see lower temperatures the more there's ice. And so in these areas where you have these very deep reds on the right, or uh, in this area right here where you see the, the, the oranges that are cooler into those greens, we have a lot of ice that's scattering the signal beneath it. Emission, by contrast, uh, increases the brightness temperature. And so in areas of increased liquid water, such as this purple area here on the right, or these uh, greens and um, reds over here, we have increased liquid water presence in the atmosphere. Mixed effects results in ambiguous interpretation. So what can we see? We could see eyewall replacement cycle in Hurricane Irma using these. Looking at the uh, 89 gigahertz, we see an inner eye and an outer eye. And on the left, we see uh, an inner eye, but something a little bit more ambiguous as far as um, could that be a moat region, could that be an area of high ice scattering. When we use 19 gigahertz, which is less susceptible to scattering, we see that, in fact, there's no moat region. There's a single eye, and then there's uh, the double eye in the upper levels that is weakening. Okay, another thing we could do to quantify the environment is to look at combining these products together. And so this is a hydrometeor false color that combines the low and the upper levels into a diagnosis of the vertical um, uh, structure of the microphysics. You can see the interpretation of the pixels there on the right. And so in this case, what we're seeing is that the relative shadings of the yellows and oranges indicates vertical alignment of the convective walls and banding. One other thing I want to point out about this product is we can look at the analysis of parallax from this as well. And so if you see the reds over here displaced from the greens beneath it, what we're actually seeing is that the ice observed by the satellite at an angle is being placed further away than is actually uh, located um, than from the liquid water, which is closer and not moved as much by parallax. And so um, by looking at these combined products, we could also get an assessment of that parallax. Finally, I want to point out that 183 gigahertz is another channel that we're trying to exploit more that hasn't been used as much to be able to fill in the gaps uh, by our constellation that's going to be uh, 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 decreasing in the future since we're now replacing microwave imagers. And so uh, we can see Hurricane Maria approaching Puerto Rico um, at 89 gigahertz, and in 183 gigahertz, we can fill in temporally the changes in structure through time. So as I said, microwave constellation is decreasing, and so because of that, we wanted to fill in some of those gaps. Here's where we're doing it. There's a, um, the COVER sensor is launching this year as a gap filler, but what we also want to do is use some of those microwave sounding technologies, such as from CubeSats, uh, instead of waiting for the follow-on microwave imagers that are uh, five years away from now. So to conclude, we do some of these new real-time um, products online. We're transitioning um, some of this new open source processing with the products I've shown you. And uh, what we can use with these new sensors from geostationary and microwave imagers greatly expand our ability to dissect the cyclone environment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we do have time for a question or two. Okay, well, thank you so much. Our next speaker is... Matthias Schreier? Matthias, I am sorry. <laughs> and you said you were on IMAP. I'm on IMAP, yes. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my talk is about uncertainties in microwave retrieval, so I apologize in advance if it gets a little bit boring. But what I'm trying to convince you in the next minute is that you can actually reduce the uncertainties in microwave sounder information uh, retrievals when you add sickness information. And I want to do this uh, based on observations on, during the Hurricane Harvey due to the fact that we have a bunch of observations of Harvey during the Epoch campaign. In case you were not present in the morning, the Epoch campaign was the East Pacific origin and characteristics of hurricanes, which was luckily not really restricted to the Pacific, but we could also measure in the Atlantic. 
And the goal was to use observations from the global hawk with different kinds of instruments to observe the hurricane intensification, in this case, during hurri of Hurricane Harvey. The main instruments uh, on the Global Hawk were x uh, AWEBS, but what I want to talk to you about today is Hamza, which is a microwave sounder with 25 channels, which is mainly in the O2 and H2O band. So it's able to make sounding of temperature and water vapor <laughs> under clear and uh, cloudy conditions and also under lightly scattering conditions. So the second flight of the, ECO, of the EPOC campaign was actually on 23rd and 24th uh, August 2017, where Harvey made re intensification over the Gulf of Mexico. So to be honest with you, it was not actually a hurricane at this moment. It was still a tropical storm. I think it was actually in the beginning a tropical depression. But, um, but you can actually see in this slightly psychedelic picture here in the, upper, in the lower corner that it had already a pretty good structure and we were able to make a few very good measurements. So the flight path which was chosen was a little bit limited due to, due to technical and flight restrictions and due to some complications which we had with Hamza in the beginning. But when it comes to the, the system itself, we were actually able to make a bunch of pretty good observations of the central system by flying cross sections in the middle and by the surrounding, of, uh, by, and also by observing the surrounding by flying these triangles around. So we have actually a very good real-time retrieval system, but it doesn't include scattering, so it's not really good when it comes to the core of the system. So for the post-processing, we actually uh, developed a new retrieval system, which is called Ratatouille, which is actually just a rat which a pretty, with a pretty long tail in the end. The, because the main, main important part is just that it's a retrieval algorithm test bed. It's a modular system where you can actually put in several different uh, microwave sound instruments. You can put in several kinds of a priori and background information. You can also use different kinds of forward models as long as you have the coefficients for the instrument in these forward models. And we are also planning to, to change the surface emissivity system. So the, the point about Rata 2 is actually to keep it modular, interchangeable, and pretty simple and easy to understand that you can actually uh, exchange the components very easily and compare the different components during your retrieval. So as I said, uh, it's, I try to keep it simple. So there is no tweaking, there is no tuning involved, and there is for sure no preference, because I don't really care if CRTM or RTTOF is better, or which kind of background is better, ECMW, WF, and Mera 2. My point is just to compare how the results diverge if I use different kinds of components. Another component which I added a few months ago is the Cygnus wind component which is the reason why I give this talk today, is where I use the uh, Cygnus Level 3 data and adapt it to the grid of the background to add it to my, into my information before I do, re do the retrieval. The solver approach is optimal estimation. So it's a little bit relying on the adjoints and Jacobians, which the radiative transfer code gives me. Yet in principle, I could also calculate my own, my own Jacobians. Or actions. So just to show you that it at least works pretty good when it comes to, uh, to higher levels, uh, I show you retrieved temperature and water vapor uh, observations at 200 hectopascal. You can actually see that the warm core is pretty visible during the, uh, during the observations uh, of the cross section and that you also see a water vapor increase when you can get nearer to the center of the hurricane. But what I want to show you is what happens to when you do, when you exchange the wind on the surface, because usually people don't believe a microwave retrieval near to the surface anyway, because there's just too much influence from the surface. 
So I want to show you what happens if you do a calculation, if you do a retrieval with ECMWF wind, or if you do a calculation with, with Cygnus wind. So if you compare the two pictures, there's actually not, not a big difference. However, if you subtract the two big pictures from each other, then you can see that at least in the area of the center of the storm, there's a big difference between the two retrievals. You can actually have differences of up to two or three Kelvin in this area. And that's actually exactly where the center of the storm is, or at least near to the center of the storm. The water vapor behaves a little bit different, at least at the, in this low level at 900 hectopascal. So if, again, if you just look by eye, if you calculate with ECMWF wind, or if you calculate with Cygnus wind, it doesn't make a big difference. And if you can calculate the difference, um, there's actually no big difference in the core. It's actually, you can sometimes have in certain spots differences of up to one gram per Kelvin, but it's more scattered around the whole area. It's not really centralized. However, things change a little bit if you focus on the central area and look on the vertical structure of the, te uh, of the temperature and water vapor retrieval, because the, area, the difference is not only happening here on the surface where you would expect it, but it's also propagating a little bit up to 900, 800 hectopascal. And it's mainly happening in the temperature, but it's affecting the water vapor too in this case. So the, the, the retrieval tries to balance everything out, uh, out and affects the temperature and the water, and water vapor just due to, due to the fact that you change the wind uh, in the re retrieval. And this, of course, affects the relative humidity. Uh, you can actually have changes up to 25% in this area just due to the fact if you, if you have a, a sickness wind or if you have ECMWF wind in this area. And there's also a slight change in the liquid and ice in distribution. However, I keep the liquid and ice uh, retrieval very restricted because otherwise the retrieval gets just crazy. So to try to convince you that it signals actually improves the retrieval a little bit, I show you the chi-squared error, which is the difference more or less between the observed and the calculated brightness temperatures. And as you can see, uh, you have a, a small change, um, not a re really great, but up to 5 or even 10% difference if you use Cygnus data instead of ECMWF data. I admit it's still a small change compared to the fact that you have scattering in, in this area and have huge errors because uh, of the rain in, in this retrieval. But due, just due to the fact that you use a different kind of wind, you can actually decrease the chi-square by 5 to 10%. So just shortly, because there are only 50 left, this is actually also transferable to satellite retrievals, like for example ATMS. Uh, that's actually the same scene, that's Hurricane Harvey again. And it's just a calculation by using ATMS instead of Hamza in this case. And you can see there's only a small difference, but it's still again in, near to the core when it comes to the temperature retrieval. It's the same for the water vapor. You have actually at 900 hectopascal slight differences in the water vapor retrieval. And that's just going across the cross sections across highway during the, during the overflight. And you can actually see that the temperature and the water vapor errors don't actually always have to be at the same place. But the relative humidity changes and usually more or less there where the water vapor uh, difference happens. You can still have changes of up to one Kelvin in temperature and you can have changes up to 0.5 water, uh, grams per kilogram in the water vapor, which, if, which results in relative humidity changes up to 20%. So what I wanted to show you in my talk is that we, did an we tested an implementation of Cygnus data in our microwave sounder retrieval, that the comparison of Hamza retrievals with Cygnus data and ECMWF data can show actually differences not only on the surface but also in slightly higher, lower tropospheric levels. And they can actually be up to 3 Kelvin in temperature of 1 gram in water vapor and that um, up, up to yeah, up to 20% in the liquid, uh, in the um, relative humidity. However, the signal data results in a decrease of, of this chi-squared error of approximately 5 to 10%. And similar results are also seen for ATMS, but not so strongly. 
And I admit that the other things like scattering are still the dominant source in uh, error source in this area, but at least with Cygnus data, data, it seems you can reduce the wind error or the surface data error. Okay, thanks for your attention. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, thank you very much. So our next speaker is Gail Skafronek Jackson. Yes, you do. I'm on a Mac. make some joke about the number of people in this audience don't seem to, I mean, of all the people here, is this all the people that care about hurricanes? Well, whatever. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> Maybe we don't get so many questions, that's why we have fewer people in the audience. Anyway, I'm very pleased to be here. I'm Gail Skafronik Jackson. Um, I'm at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, and I want to acknowledge my co-authors. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about the Global Precipitation Measurement Mission. It's a NASA mission that's joint with the Japanese Aerospace and Exploration Agency, or JAXA for short. Um, and so I'm just going to go ahead and march through my slides here. And with my first two slides are going to talk about the GPM mission, and then I'm going to jump into the details of the different storms that we measured this uh, over the Atlantic hurricane season, this past hurricane season. So the GPM um, mission was launched in February 2014, and we um, have been taking data since, so it's about three and a half, almost four years worth of data. And our science objectives are listed up there in the text. Can I get the mouse to oh, yes. point to things? Um, yeah, I have to do it this way. Oh, that's confusing. Okay, so these are the science objectives. And um, basically, we, uh, there, are about five, there are five of them. Um, and the first one is really to improve the uh, calibration standards, the accuracy of precipitation retrievals from space. And we do that mainly with our GPM core observatory. Um, and then you can see that in that upper image um, where this is the precipitation that we get um, over, I think that's about a week time frame of accumulation, or maybe it's our 30 minute segment. And then with that data, we can use it to address the four other objectives um, in terms of some of the imagery you see on the, the left and the right hand side there, how we can use this as integrated application goals. GPM was designed not only for research, but also for societal applications. Um, so this is, I'm gonna now talk about the GPM core observatory, which was the spacecraft that was launched and built by NASA and JAXA. And then I'm gonna talk about the constellation that, that kind of feeds in there. Um, so as I said, it was launched in February 2014. We kind of have a unique non-sun synchronous orbit. So we go plus or minus 65 degrees latitude. That gives us samples at all times of the day. So you can get some more diurnal samples. Um, and we have two instruments on board. One is the GPM microwave imager, or GMI for short. It's a passive microwave imager. It goes from 10 gigahertz to 183 gigahertz. And I think the tropical cyclone, the NRL was showing, maybe, I couldn't quite see if they were showing some of the 183 gigahertz from their, from their high frequencies. Um, and this allows us just to see basically wide swath, 885 kilometers, precipitation rates at the surface. It sees all the way through the cloud to the surface and gets those precipitation rates. We also have the dual frequency precipitation on radar, which was built by the Japanese, and, um, uh, and they actually launched us. It has two radar frequencies, so you can see layer by layer every 250 meters, and because there's two frequencies, you can actually get drop size distributions of the particle sizes within each one of those layers. Um, and then the, the footprint of that is about five kilometers at the Earth's surface. And uh, in green are the um, scientific objectives from the previous slide. So when we go to the constellation in the upper, um, in the upper right hand image up here, that's the GPM core observatory. And all the other sensors are passive sensors, radiometers and, and um, sounders that have been launched by uh, domestic and international partners, so NOAA, DMSP, 
um, International UMET SAT, JAXA has GCOMW, and they're willing to share their data with, with, with GPM and NASA so that we can intercalibrate them and get uniform estimates um, everywhere in the world. And that helps us to get our, improve our knowledge of water cycle variability and floods, landslides, and freshwater resources. But most importantly for this talk is to be able to identify the hurricanes and the impacts of hurricanes both in applications and, and tracking them and when they're coming on shore. So this is um, the GPM Core Observatory and the merged views of Hurricane Irma. So this little zoom in here, as you can see, the, the wide swath at the surface in greens to reds, liquid precipitation, and then from blues to purples, frozen precipitation. So you can see above the melting layer where the, there's ice in, these, these, uh, in this um, Hurricane Irma. And then in the background, when it starts going again, this is iMERGE, which is our integrated multi-satellite retrievals for GPM, iMERGE, and it'll continue to go till we get another shot. And iMERGE is um, every 30 minutes at a 0.1 by 0.1 degree grid box, so that's about 10 kilometers by 10 kilometers, and it's available four hours after the event. So it's near real time, um, and it's very good for being able to predict floods and landslides and things like that, which I'll get into more detail. So this is just another slice. So you see the GPM Core Observatory is not observing everything globally, but we put it together with these 10 other partner satellites to be able to get these better estimates. Um, so I'm gonna move into some of the applications. This is the uh, Hurricane Harvey flood susceptibility. In the um, upper left-hand image, this is the three-day rainfall accumulation um, as of August 30th, and that the reds are um, 300 millimeters accumulation in, in about a three-day period. In the bottom left is the, um, the uh, flood uh, forecast, essentially, and reds are um, 200 millimeters uh, above, um, the, I guess, the normal. Um, and uh, so you can see that there was flooding, and then the, the bottom right-hand image is just another core observatory overpass which was showing rain rates of 96 millimeters per hour, you know, almost four inches per hour, so very significant rain associated with this. Uh, and you can get more details on this methodology at flood.umd.edu. Um, another application area was landslides, um, and this landslide data was used by a host of different agencies um, to be able to be, have their situational awareness. On the left-hand side is a one-day rain accumulation from iMERGE, and the, the kind of dark oranges are about 120 millimeter, 20 millimeters or so. Um, and then the landslide now cast, which is based on the precipitation and slope characteristics and vegetation on those slopes and things like that. Um, where, so if you take the one day accumulation, it's within that yellow box. And so those reds and oranges mean that there's a higher probability that there would be a landslide in, in those, on those uh, Caribbean islands there. Um, now we also use some um, uh, the sh sport um, uh, data. It's basically where they take research data from NASA and NOAA, and they basically transition it to operations. So they take data that is important. They don't take all NASA data and all NOAA data and tr um, uh, do a research operations, but just um, the most uh, important and unique stuff that's needed by the operational agencies. So this is one of the sport um, activities that they were doing, um, putting the data into dec decision to sport tools. And uh, one of the things that we were really proud about is if you see in that text box up there is one of the uh, National Hurricane Center forecasts um, for um, Irma there. In the blue, you can see they actually use the GMI data to back up their, their forecast. Um, so that's for, for us at NASA that basically do research to see that our data is used in um, operational forecasts is great. Now, the other thing about GMI data, the brightness temperatures are, we have a requirement of getting them out to the public within one hour. Typically, on average, they're out in 17 minutes after the event. So this data comes out really, really fast, so it's important. Um, it, it is very almost operational in, in terms of the data that it gets out in brightness temperatures. For, for rain rates from it, it's a little, it's like 25 minutes, so that's still really great. Um, moving on here, because tick-tock, tick-tock. Um, 
Uh, in Puerto Rico, the, um, the weather radars that they use for their local weather radar um, estimates or actually ac activities was highly damaged. So sport provided weather forecasts for them and accumulations so that they would know about floods and would know about if they needed to worry about dams and things like that overflowing. Um, the, I'm going to spend one slide talking about the validation of this and we use the MRMS data. Um, it basically starts with a radar data that's bias adjusted um, and it, it's at a 0.01 degree and two minute resolution that's then uh, upscaled to the iMERGE product. And so in this chart you can see in the upper plots the rain intensity in terms of millimeters per hour and uh, that, uh, I'm trying to, I, can't, oh, I can see it there. It's, a, it's 120 is like the, the orange red, the, the higher orange red. And you can see that um, relative to MRMS, the iMERGE detects the heavy rain. So you see that big white box? That's because the radars cannot see a long distance away. So you can't see any of the rain in the, in the uh, gulf there from the, the ground-based uh, data. But uh, you can see all of it basically coming in from iMERGE. Um, and then in terms of the accumulations, the patterns are similar, but the, the heaviest uh, rain is, comes at different locations. So uh, I'm not going to show this one. This just shows the estimates of the different constellation members and how well uh, they're doing with respect. Um, how's the microphone go off when the time runs out, maybe? No. That's <laughs> so here are some of the websites to be able to actually get the data. Um, and I'm going to let this movie play if there are any questions. Maybe you want to ask questions so you can watch the movie play. But it just shows iMERGE and then all the tracks of the hurricane starting at the beginning of um, August. So uh, they slowly uh, uh, place themselves there. So. And we do have plenty of time for questions. So. Okay. Yep. All right. You did great. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, how often does the GPM core satellite pass over a given storm? Or how, how many times? Well, so because it's a non-sun synchronous at 65 degrees mm -hmm. um, latitude, in the tropics it doesn't go over as often, but if you get closer and closer to 65, just because it's going, it's kind of a sinusoidal oh, pattern. So it, if you wanted to look at the same exact spot at the same exact time of day, it's about 150 to 180 days. But sometimes we get it every at 65 degrees, I mean, I've seen eight overpasses in a location up at around 65, but it's, it's quite, a, quite a bit fewer at the equator. Right. Okay. Okay. Uh, if we had trim still up there, which has plus or minus 35, we would get more uh, near the equator. But iMERGE gives all the data, so we put it all together. iMERGE is every 30 minutes. It, yeah. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank okay. you so much. Thank you. Okay, so our next speaker is Anthony Carl Didlake. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, today I'll be talking about uh, some work that I'm doing with uh, Matt Cumgen at Penn State, uh, looking at uh, dual polar, polar metric radar data from um, several hurricanes out there, one of them Hurricane Irma. So I can't stress enough at how important it is for us to get um, more uh, microphysical information from uh, tropical cyclones. Um, these uh, microphysics remain a large source of uncertainty in both the model simulations and also our scientific understanding of these TCs. 
but with the upgrade of the ADAD radars, we're able to um, get more information uh, from any storm that is within range of uh, the land-based radars. And so this dual polarization uh, capabilities provide critical uh, microphysical information from these TCs. So a brief overview of um, some of the variables I'll be using in this talk. Um, uh, so reflectivity is, the, uh, is, is what we all know, um, measuring the uh, particle size and concentration or just the intensity of the rain. And so this is at uh, horizontal polarization, ZH. Uh, or ZDR is the differential reflectivity, which is that gives you the average shape of the particles um, in a sampling volume. So with ZDR at about zero, at equal to zero, you have more spherical particles. But when it's greater than zero, you have more particles that are horizontally aligned. Uh, rho HV, which is the correlation coefficient, uh, gives you a measure of the diversity of the shape of the particles in a sampling volume. So when rho HV is equal to one, you uh, have pretty uh, large uniformity or no diversity in the shapes in the, uh, in the volume. But if you have a rho HV that's less than one, you start to get more diversity as seen in this diagram here. So uh, the work I'm doing with Irma Stim, uh, started off with work that uh, we recently published on Hurricane Arthur, where we examined 30 hours of 88D polarimetric radar data um, and examined this data in the context of the radio, azimuthal, and vertical distribution throughout the storm. Here you can see an image of uh, Arthur as it was making landfall um, in North Carolina. And so the storm uh, was uh, uh, divided into uh, different um, annuli to capture the eye wall, the inner rain bands, and the outer rain bands, and also into quadrants defined by the 200 to 850 hectopascal environmental wind shear. And so we, we decided to analyze the storm in these quadrants is because the wind shear often causes a wave number uh, one asymmetry in the storm's kinematic structure, and uh, which um, impacts the precipitation structure as well. So we found that the polarimetric radar variables um, exhibited signatures of uh, the convective and stratiform processes um, within the storm, but in different regions. And here we have the average profiles of the four different quadrants um, for ZH, ZDR, and Rho HV. Um, I'll go into the signatures a little later. Um, the observed locations of that, that showed the predominant um, convective and stratiform processes were largely consistent uh, with the expected kinematic asymmetry relative to the wind shear vector. So with Hurricane Irma, uh, we analyzed 20 hours of data from the San Juan radar um, as Irma tracked north of Puerto Rico. Um, again, we defined the annuli, um, this time looking at the primary eye wall, secondary eye wall, and the outer rain bands, here shown by the uh, bl black circles. Next, we looked at quadrants defined by not the wind shear, but the storm motion vector. Um, here the wind shear was relatively weak, so a lot of the asymmetries um, responded more to the storm relative flow as a result of the moving storm. And when you uh, go and look at past studies, um, you can, we found that uh, examining, for example, lightning maximum frequencies from Corbassiero and Molinari, um, the down shear, or I'm sorry, the front right quadrant of the inner core of the storm tended to have more lightning, um, and also in the outer rain bands, which uh, gives you a sense of where the more convective regions are in the storm. So here we're going to examine uh, these uh, polarimetric data um, based on that uh, prior study. So here I have the primary eye wall average variables, and you can see for reflectivity, the solid lines are the front right and the front left quadrants, and they have the heaviest precipitation. And if you look at the uh, ZDR, which again talks about the shape, these two quadrants um, below uh, five kilometer altitude, so in the raining region, uh, have um, the front right quadrant tends to have more horizontally aligned uh, drops seen by the higher ZDR than the front left quadrant. And at the same time, there is more diversity, so you have a lower row HV in the front right quadrant than you do in the front left quadrant, even though they have the same uh, generally average uh, reflectivity, or ZH. 
And so we can examine um, this reigning region uh, on a, a, a joint distribution uh, diagram, joint frequency distribution diagram, where you have ZH along the x-axis and ZDR, which again measures shape along the y-axis. And so examining the density plot, um, specifically the 50% uh, contours, you can see this uh, down the front right quadrant again has higher reflectivity, I'm sorry, higher Z ZDR um, than you have in the front left quadrant, um, even though they have the same reflectivity. So traveling from the front right to front left quadrants, you have the same uh, uh, reflectivity but uh, changing uh, shapes which uh, can be a signature of size sorting. So to examine that a little bit more closely, um, I looked at uh, the average um, ZH and ZDR within the eye wall, primary eye wall at three kilometers. So the color showing the reflectivity pattern um, with azimuth, uh, so it's time and azimuth, and the track direction is shown in the, this blue line here. So the colors you can see um, show the, the reflectivity uh, maximum in the storm uh, tends to remain pretty uh, steady relative to the, uh, to the um, track uh, direction, whereas just upwind of this maximum reflectivity you have in the black contours, your, uh, mac your increased uh, ZDR. So this size sorting signature with higher ZDR, just upwind of the higher ref, uh, ZH, is consistent over time. And it suggests that uh, there's a persistent eye wall updraft in this front right quadrant, which is just to the right of the track here. And these, that's, this is a result of there being heavier, um, more horizontally aligned drops that preferentially fall out closer to the updraft um, in sparser concentration while the smaller drops fall out just downwind um, in a higher concentration, but they still have the same uh, ZH. So this is consistent with the expected location that we would see with um, uh, convective processes um, where you have your strongest updraft in the front right quadrant. Oops. All right, so in the outer rain bands, um, we found that the front right and the front left quadrant, again, had the highest uh, reflectivity, or so the heaviest precipitation. And we found that the front right quadrant in the blue here um, has a larger, uh, so both, all of the quadrants have signatures in the bright band uh, region, but the front right quadrant has a wider uh, peak in the vertical um, at near the bright band. Um, and when you look at the ZDR, and this peak is also uh, corresponding to a lower rho HV. Now this is a result of um, possibly there being uh, more pristine ice particles, uh, more melting rhymed ice particles, larger drops, um, all within the front right quadrant um, that create this higher, uh, this, this higher um, ZDR uh, value uh, in a deeper uh, layer. And together, they form a population with a higher shape diversity and thus a lower um, rho HV. And, of, and also, with intense, convect with intense motions, you tend to have a more vertical mixing, which creates a smoother uh, peak than we saw in the front left quadrant. So these signatures are all consistent with um, convective processes act, uh, occurring more frequently in the front right quadrant. Whereas in the front left quadrant, there is a narrower, more peaked uh, bright band, um, and that's due to snow aggregates having less horizontal alignment and lower shape diversity. And so this, uh, in the front left quadrant, is more consistent with stratiform processes. And uh, these signatures in the outer rain bands was also consistent with Corbassiera molinari. Now finally, we have um, the secondary eye wall, which had the highest uh, reflectivity in the rear left and rear right quadrants, which of course was different from the other two anguli. And there wasn't really a, a clear uh, signature, but if we use the same principles from the previous anguli, it would, you would find that the rear left quadrant had a more stratiform signal, whereas the rear right quadrant had a more convective signal. Um, that would imply that as the, the hydrometeors are traveling around the storm, um, we, saw, we would see a stratiform to convective transition 
um, as the as as the winds uh, uh, circulate around the storm, which uh, I put a question mark there because uh, that's interesting, and I'm not quite sure if that's the case. But to further analyze it, um, uh, did the same uh, uh, plot where we have azimuth on the x-axis and and uh, and and time on the y-axis, um, and we found that. Uh, we have enhanced lines of both re uh, ZH and ZDR that propagate, um, that show propagation of heavily precipitating bands around the storm, and they all begin in the front left quadrant where the stratiform precipitation was more prominent um, uh, for the rain bands. And these bands uh, would, uh, as we, uh, if we believe the, the data here, um, would increase in convective processes as they wrap around and form a secondary eye wall. And so secondary eye wall formation is not really well understood and these data can help us understand that um, specifically uh, the str stratiform, the convective transition um, is something that some modeling and observational studies suggest is important um, for understanding this process. And so I'll just leave with my conclusions here, um, talking about the polarimetric data being important for identifying convective and stratiform uh, precipitation processes. And relating that back to the kinematics is something that's really uh, key to, to, to fully understand all of the um, different um, processes that we need to in, uh, investigate for understanding tropical cyclones. And so with that, I'll conclude. We have time for some questions. Yeah. I'm wondering if you see any evidence for evaporation occurring in the hurricane boundary layer, maybe reductions in reflectivity, but increases in CDR, and um, what you think the potential might be to quantify that evaporation rate if, if it's possible? Um, so my first thoughts on that is uh, it would be, we'd have to of course only look at the parts where the storm is closest to the radar so that we get a good sense of, a good uh, analysis of the raining layer um, as you get closer to the radar and instead of you have the beam uh, going upward in altitude. Um, I'm not sure if I saw that anywhere um, and if we were to see that um, it would probably be most, um, uh, most um, clear in the stratiform regions where you also have drier air. Um, yeah, I'd have to look more closely at the data to, to look for that particular signal, but that's a good, um, good thought. Yeah, maybe near the moat region or like you said in the stratiform areas uh, could be a useful way to look at thermodynamically what's going yeah, on. Yeah, definitely. Any other questions? We still have some time. Okay. Thank you so much. Thanks. Okay, so our next speaker is uh, George Bryan, and he will be speaking to us about unique observations in Hurricane Maria 2017 using the Coyote Unscrewed Aircraft System, UAS. Okay, this works. Okay. Okay, got it. I think I'll use the mouse. Hey, thank you, Courtney. So I'm going to do my best to represent this uh, large and diverse group of uh, meteorologists and engineers and uh, numerical modelers. Uh, they're using this instrument shown in the picture in the upper left uh, corner here. This is a, uh, a vehicle uh, designed and uh, produced by the Raytheon company. It's called the uh, Coyote and it's a drone or UAS or UAV depending on uh, which uh, term you prefer to use. Uh, I definitely want to give, uh, oh, so I should say, my name is George Bryan. I work at NCAR, which is the National Center for Atmospheric Research. Uh, but I've listed as my uh, uh, lead author in this talk of uh, Joe Sion, who's not attending this meeting this week. He's a scientist at uh, NOAA's Hurricane Research Division, who is really the, 
uh, leader of this group and uh, the guiding force behind uh, getting these uh, inst instruments and this uh, data from Hurricane Maria. Uh, so to explain uh, what is the Coyote US, this is an excellent picture here. And in brief, it's an experimental, small, semi-autonomous, uh, uncrewed aircraft, which is deployed from a crewed aircraft. And so in this picture in the background here, you can see the uh, NOAA's P-3 Orion aircraft, which uh, has a crew, it has people on board, uh, both men and women, hence we use the term crewed rather than manned. Uh, we'll see if that terminology catches on though. Uh, this handsome fellow here is uh, our leader, Joe Sion, and he's holding the uh, Coyote UAS, which is about one meter long and uh, has a wingspan of uh, just under uh, two meters wide. And to explain how this system works, uh, I'm going to show this animation here. I'll loop through this a couple times. Uh, many thanks to the uh, Coyote engineers who've uh, provided this easy to understand uh, animation here. So this uh, aircraft, which is the P3 aircraft, is going to fly overhead. Oh, and if I click on the right part of the screen, you'll see that the I have to click down here. There it goes. You'll see the coyote comes out in this tube and a parachute slows its descent so the tube can fall away, the wings can uh, pop out. Uh, Two-way uh, radio link between the coyote and uh, engineers on board the P3 is established. At some point the parachute uh, goes away, the uh, propeller turns on and we achieve uh, level flight. And I'll play this again here so you can get a sense of uh, what's happening. So if you're familiar with uh, uh, collecting data in hurricanes, part of the hardest part um, is actually getting to the hurricane to collect observations because most hurricanes, especially the strong ones, are far from land. Uh, there's there's uh, very few instruments out over the open oceans. And so the NOAA P-3 aircraft flies uh, probably dozens of missions every year uh, as part of reconnaissance and uh, in the research. I'll play this one more time. And the idea here with the uh, Coyote UAS is to uh, collect some data where the uh, NOAA aircraft uh, cannot fly because uh, the conditions are too hazardous. And this includes very low levels uh, in the uh, atmosphere, uh, several hundred, or the lowest few hundred meters above the ocean surface. Or there's very sparse observations, and uh, not the kind of observations we need to uh, advance some of our, our scientific questions, uh, particularly with regards to numerical model development and uh, um, some other applications I'll talk about later. So the atmospheric measurements that uh, we're collecting, uh, for more details, uh, for those that are interested, I, I draw your attention to this article by uh, Sion et al., which is published in the AGU's Earth and Space Science Journal uh, last year. So basically we measure uh, wind speed, uh, uh, perhaps uh, three components of, of wind speed if you process the data very carefully, uh, up to about uh, 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 10 hertz, a very high frequency data, that means uh, 10 measurements every second. Uh, we also collect uh, pressure, temperature, and, and humidity data. There's some uh, details there on the bottom for those that are interested. Uh, new for 2017, as I understand, is an infrared sensor that uh, can be used to measure sea surface temperature if the UAV is very close to the uh, ocean surface. And uh, all data in this talk are very preliminary, and that's the case for all talks in this session. Um, but uh, we're still processing these data and trying to understand uh, uh, how best to extract the uh, information we need to do the science. Uh, the wind speed data I'm going to analyze in this talk is provided by NOAA's uh, ATDD, the Atmospheric Turbulence and Diffusion uh, Division. Uh, and this, uh, the staff here, uh, many thanks to uh, you guys for uh, providing data here for this talk. So that's the background on the instrument, and uh, I'm going to talk to you for the rest of this talk about some data we collected during Hurricane Maria uh, in late September of this year. Um, here's the track of, uh, of Maria, and we're, uh, we collected it on uh, three consecutive days, not uh, continuous measurements, but in uh, short periods of time over these three days. Uh, what's special about this uh, area, it's uh, we can't operate the coyote over populated areas and also this particular storm wasn't uh, threatening land at this uh, particular time, so it freed up the uh, scientists and, and staff uh, aboard the NOAA aircraft to, to focus on more uh, research uh, rather than reconnaissance. Um, just a quick satellite image to give you a sense of what Hurricane Maria looked like in the, uh, what I believe is the middle of these three days. Um, it's a symmetric, uh, very classic looking hurricane with a very obvious eye. Um, most of the days we collect the data, this is a category three storm with a uh, maximum winds of about a, a 100 knots at the uh, 10 meter uh, level. And one of the reasons I showed you this uh, image is uh, our operations were in here, uh, in the center of the storm in the most hazardous area of uh, the tropical cyclone. 
So these uh, Coyote UAS uh, provide some uh, unique observational data that uh, has either never been collected before or has only very rarely been collected before. Uh, this is an image of uh, three Coyote flights, um, the center of the hurricane on uh, 23 September. For, um, you can barely see from the satellite image, it's sort of cloud covered uh, at this time. Uh, but here's the three flights of the of Coyote UAS. The color scheme here indicates the wind speed as measured by the, the, the platform. Uh, I highlight two general uh, flight strategies that uh, we've used. Uh, one is reconnaissance, um, illustrated by these uh, two flights on the right, where uh, the aircraft is flying around the uh, uh, eye wall of the hurricane, looking for and measuring the uh, maximum of wind speeds in the hurricane. Uh, I'm actually particularly interested in some fundamental research that can be uh, done with the uh, UAS, including flying very low in the boundary layer, this lowest few hundred meters above the ocean surface, measuring things like uh, hopefully turbulent fluxes, uh, eddy dissipation rate, uh, and also getting a sense of the structure of the turbulence uh, from these measurements. Uh, here's an overall summary. summary. There were uh, six total Coyote flights on these uh, three days. Three were uh, these eyewall modules that I, I just described, uh, searching for the maximum winds. Uh, one, which I'll focus on later, was a so-called inflow module. We were flying in the uh, in low levels from outside the storm towards the center of the storm, uh, which is the uh, low-level inflow for uh, tropical cyclones. Two ended up being, unfortunately, what we call glider flights. There were problems with the engine, and uh, you basically got uh, just a gradual descent over like a six to ten minute uh, time period. And uh, it occurred to me, I just uh, realized I forgot to mention that uh, one other unique aspect of the Coyote UAS compared to some other uh, unmanned uh, systems is the Coyote is um, essentially expendable. It uh, doesn't come back. It, uh, at the end of its mission, uh, if the battery runs out or um, if there's some plot problems with flight, it splashes down in the ocean and uh, presumably sinks to the uh, bottom of the ocean. Uh, this sort of increases the cost of this program, as you might imagine, but it also frees you up to uh, go into some areas of the storm you would never consider going into uh, if you had a, a much more expensive uh, system that you uh, needed to get back. Uh, so the longest flight uh, among these uh, uh, missions in Murillo, uh, the longest flight was 43 minutes long, and the maximum wind speed that was measured was uh, 64 meters per second at uh, 340 meters above sea level. Um, I mentioned earlier this is a semi-autonomous uh, system. Uh, so it has an onboard autopilot. It can more or less fly itself, if you will. Uh, but it needs direction. It needs, needs to be told where to go and what altitude, et cetera. And here's one of these uh, eyewall uh, missions. You can see some kinks in this track here. This is uh, uh, longitude and latitude. And uh, the, the kite was released here. The colors indicate altitude. And so we gradually descended along this path. But you can see the kink where uh, waypoints were updated along this uh, uh, flight path. Uh, so the next, uh, I'm going to show you some data on the next slide is from this flight here. This is one of our so-called um, uh, our, our, uh, descents, uh, very quick descents. So it was only about seven minutes long, but we, I know we did collect over 3,000 measurements of wind speed, even on this, uh, uh, this very short uh, flight path here uh, through the eye wall of, uh, of Hurricane Maria. Uh, this is uh, one of the reasons of showing this data is this is the... Um, sort of the longest segment of uh, high frequency data uh, we were able to obtain. So here's a roughly two minute long uh, time series of, of wind speed measured from the aircraft. And you can see uh, obvious uh, evidence of fluctuations here and, and, and turbulent flow. Uh, for the specialists here, I'm going to do a very quick analysis. We uh, took this roughly one minute long segment here, detrended it, and uh, did a Fourier analysis. Uh, so here's a, a, a spectrum of the horizontal uh, wind speeds, and if you're not familiar with looking at spectra, one thing you uh, uh, might uh, draw your attention to is uh, uh, you expect or, or hope anyway that the uh, uh, spectra of wind speed have a, a, a capital or a frequency to the minus five thirds slope in a log log plot like this. Uh, the black lines are the, the raw data, and the blue is a, a, an averaged uh, representation of that. And you can see something fairly close to that, which was, uh, is very encouraging to see. Uh, but again, this is very preliminary data. You might notice a, 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 a peak that seems to be at about 0.8 hertz. So we're not quite sure if that represents a, a physical meteorological phenomena or some artifact of the, of the processing or the instrument itself or, if you will, the flight operations. Uh, this is analysis I wanted to do. We have some uh, uh, similar data from a, a program called Seablast, which was held in 2003. Uh, here's some data from Hurricane Isabel. 
Um, so this is when the P3 was still allowed to fly at low levels. This is a, a little bit lower altitude than the, the, this, these Coyote data. It was at uh, 100 meters lower and uh, slightly weaker wind speeds, but they had a, a very high quality uh, turbulence gust probe on this flight, uh, 40 hertz measurements, and you can see it produces qualitatively and quantitatively similar spectrum, which again is very encouraging to, to see. It gives us some uh, uh, promise that we can uh, do some uh, scientific measurements uh, with these data, like uh, you can calculate uh, from the slope and magnitude of this, uh, these curves the eddy dissipation rate, for example. Uh, another analysis from one of our longer flights, this is more than a half hour uh, flight, and I'm just plotting here the uh, altitude along the uh, uh, that the coyote was flying at. You can see several uh, relatively level flight segments where we can do some uh, analysis of the, of the wind speed. Here's a, uh, uh, about a three minute long uh, segment of wind speed flying at roughly 400 meters uh, above the ocean surface. I didn't do it. <laughs> is, that, is that a fire alarm? I don't know. It's not my fault. <laughs> It wasn't you, we're not blaming you. Okay. I, th I think we're okay. Yes, I think we're okay. <laughs> I, think, I think I'll continue on, Courtney tells me I think. Yeah. If it goes off uh, again, we have to leave. <laughs> so the average wind speed in this flight segment is 55 meters per second. The standard deviation is just under four, and if you divide those two numbers, uh, you get a measure known as turbulence intensity. And we got a value of 0.07, and uh, that, it is actually a pretty reasonable value, and I actually uh, took some data from a large eddy simulation I, I did recently, which uh, uh, shows uh, turbulence intensity as a function of height. And we got similar magnitude values, although uh, depending on how you look at it, either the model's too low or the, the observational data is too high. Uh, this is very early in this analysis. I'm not ready to rule out either one of those options at this point. Uh, one of my last slides here, looking at the uh, very obvious oscillation in there. This has many people uh, excited about the fact we may be measuring uh, boundary layer rolls. Sort of. Okay, coming back on. Uh, apologies to Evan, I'm not going to have much time to talk about this data, but we also collect thermodynamic observations. Uh, very quick. Uh, conclusion here, the uh, Coyote data seems to suggest that the h wharf modeling system is a little bit too cool in the boundary layer compared uh, to observations. And uh, apologies to Altu, uh, who we're doing some uh, OSI, some observing system simulation experiments uh, as well, seeing how the uh, Coyote data can affect, uh, uh, when assimilated into numerical modeling system, can affect forecasts. Uh, here's a summary. You can read uh, the main points here. At the bottom, I'd like to acknowledge, I, uh, acknowledge the uh, National Science Foundation for funding my analysis of these data, and these two NOAA offices for actually providing funding to, to purchase these uh, Coyote aircraft systems. With that, I think I'll conclude. Great. Thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, just out of interest, uh, does it have an accelerometer on board? Is this locked? What kind of G-forces is such a... Yeah, there is an accelerometer on board. I don't know what kind of G-forces. Um, maybe uh, I can figure that out from one of my colleagues, and uh, perhaps you can come up and ask me later. Thanks. question is about endurance. Um, roughly one hour, I've been told, um, with a different battery, you can fly uh, maybe an hour and a half up to two hours, but we, we only got uh, uh, up to 45 minutes uh, in these flights, in part because we were really stressing the system, seeing what we could accomplish, what, what parts of the storm we could fly into. A couple of these flights, we um, more or less lost the aircraft. It didn't stay in the air. It uh, prematurely fell into the ocean. But one, one to one and a half hours is the top endurance. Okay, well, thank you so much. Okay, and then our last speaker today is Suzanne Lenher. And she will be discussing significant wave height under Hurricane Irma derived from SAR Sentinel 1 data.
Yes. I got to switch you out. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. So, um, ah, okay. We want to make sure you have the right things. That's good. This is your mouse. Thank you. No problem. Okay. So we're at the very bottom now, under the hurricanes, directly on the sea surface. I added in wind speed to the significant wave height. Uh, because we had a, quite a lot of radar images that will penetrate the clouds and show you the sea surface. And uh, this work has been performed together with, I'm personally at DLR, German Aerospace Center, with the Nova Southeastern University, Alex Soloviev, and uh, colleagues from University of Guam and Simon Fraser. Um, so, as an introduction, you have different kind of radar frequencies that correspond to different bands. And the satellite I've been busy with is this Terrasa X with three centimeter wavelengths. Then we get now wells of data from the Sentinels, that C-band, like radar set, what probably most people are used to. And uh, so we use these sound images to image the sea surface under the 2017 hurricanes. And as, as examples, I'm mainly going to show Irma and Jose. And we derived wind speed and sea state parameters. The wind speed at the sea surface, which is usually tuned like the scatterometers to U10 in 10 meter height, whatever that means in a hurricane. Um, the wind speed measurements are now done uh, either in copolarization, HH and VV, that is for uh, Terrasa X. And these uh, roughness measurements, these backscatter measurements, usually saturate, and that is well known, at low 20 to 30 meter per second. So whenever people in talks showed you wind speeds from Hurricane, from radar set, it was kind of red above 20 meter per second. So usually you could just measure up to that, which is not even Hurricane wind speed. And now we have, uh, with the Sentinel data, this HV channel, which in very high resolution will give you the opportunity to measure up to 60 meter per second now. That's a new development. The other is much more data, and you have it available on the web. It is a kind of nice combination. Um, a second thing we did, which is completely new, I would say, in this area, is that we used uh, the SAR imagery to, to determine the significant wave height under the hurricane. So if you are a wave modeler, we can now validate wave models in an aerial sense. Um, we as well have a wealth of X-band data from Terrasa X. Uh, they as well saturate, and in addition, they show a lot more rain effects. Now you could be very sad about that, but as you could see, many people here in the room as well talking about rain measurements. These can be analyzed to, anal uh, to, to look at the rain features and the variability in the wind field at a very, very high resolution. They are up to three meter resolution. Okay, and then the nicest thing is these, these Sentinel data are free on ESA's website. You get a nice toolbox that is not always perfect, but at least you can kind of analyze them at home and uh, for free. That is, I think, quite a convincing argument. I'm going to do four, looking at four main studies. Um, of course, the landfall is very interesting with Sentinel and Terrasa X. Then, uh, due to uh, ESA, I think what is really very nice is uh, they uh, did an intensive acquisition scheme. Uh, these data do not come like the geostationary um, products every 10 minutes or so, but it's polar orbiting satellites these are because they have a dust dawn orbit, because they need intensive energy. So it is not so easy to catch the eye and, and, and take these images. So this time we did a, did a very nice acquisition 
scheme uh, where we caught the eye of several hurricanes several times. And so maybe many of the algorithms people are used to have to be kind of, oh, this is an opportunity to improve them, to retune them, because you don't have very often these very high wind speed measurements. So this is just grabbed off the websites. This is the uh, Irma from SAR. This is from Sentinel SAR. And uh, the unique thing with this is the high resolution. If you zoom into the eye, you can really observe, and I hope this convinces you, that you observe the sea surface, uh, that you can observe the waves, the ocean waves, the change in wavelengths. And so that can be used as well to, to say something about the, the ocean waves, which is, again, driving all uh, the inundation models. Uh, I put at the right-hand side uh, a cloud image just to show you the difference between the optical and the radar image. And it would, of course, be very interesting to put this together with these time series of the GOES images to observe the eye on the sea surface and the eye at the, at, uh, the uh, top of the cloud. So he was talking about this tilt of the eyes, and I think this you could observe here with the combination as well. Just a quick to show you the difference between radar and optical sensors. So you have difference in wavelengths. And with radar, we talk about the X band, the C band, and the L band, going from 3 to 5 to 25 centimeter radar wavelength. And US, I think, is going with NISA, going to have an L band satellite. At the moment, it's a Japanese satellite, ALAS. Pulsar is giving you L band imagery. But C band is the workhorses, Sentinel, and radar set. And active sensors polar orbiting. And actually, what I told you is that these data are already kind of collected and available a few hours after acquisition as wind fields from, from Sentinel in this VV, VH mode. And uh, you can see all the images that were taken over IRMA from Sentinel, because they are just available for free. And the National Ice Center puts it under SAR wind onto the web page. And you can see that actually there's two different measurement scales. And you can see this heavy saturation at VV, VH. So all, everywhere where you are red, you are even below uh, here in these VV acquisitions. You are below hurricane wind force. You very well see the structure and the outer wind field, though below the red, below 20 meter per second. That's here. And for the new mode, HVVH, you can go up to much higher wind speeds. And you as well can see here with Irma or there with Jose that we can now really image the eye and the ring of maximum wind speed and the highest wind speeds. And uh, so uh, the algorithms to derive from a SAR image, the wind speed, is you determine the streaks, you calibrate the image, you get the incidence angle, and you have a rather complicated inversion uh, function that uh, contains at least 14 parameters for incidence angle as well to get the wind field, and in particular the wind speed U10. And you retune this for all the different kind of radar wavelengths you have. And, uh, between VV and VH, you can tr translate the measurements here with a uh, function that's exponential in incidence angle. And uh, now, you do not only have this VV channel that is saturating at 20 meter per second, but you have this other channel in VH, and you can study the eye. Uh, for instance, by overlaying the VV channel in red here, the VH channel in green, and what you can, can easily see is that when the wind speed becomes large and you are here in the radius of maximum wind speed, this VH channel that usually shows the sea surface in very low dB values, or usually the sea surface is black, is now taking over, and mainly here in, in, in the eye wall, you get the measurements non-saturating from this cross-polarization channel while in the outer area you get the measurements mainly from the channel uh, that is copolarized. And I just put a cut, you could see it just now, a cut at constant range, and you can see that uh, here for the sigma naught, the normalized calibrated backscatter and the vertical polarization channel, you can, if you go towards the eye of the hurricane in range, you can see that it's completely saturated at minus 7 dB. That's around these 20 meter per second. So you cannot measure the wind speed here. You do observe the eye, though. While when you go to the other channel, the cross polarized channel, uh, you can see here that you get uh, uh, a linear trend in sigma zero, so you can measure 
increasing wind speed. And what is very nice and interesting as well is that you get a completely different eye shape. Um, that's particularly interesting. There are lots of publications about the eye shape in SAR, and now that you have a different channel, the eyes look different and maybe some of these articles have to be re re rewritten, including mine, I guess, but this is what happens when you get new measurements. And you can use this VH channel now with an empirical algorithm, independent of range and wind direction, just to simply translate by linear transformation from, uh, from the sigma naught, from the calibrated backscatter to the wind speed measurements, and you get above 35. And I guess with the retuning of the algorithms, as you had a linear trend, you will get up to 60 meter per second. And as well, of course, you can structure, uh, can, can study the structure of this eye wall, and it would be very nice to put this together with cloud imagery and see whether you get this tilting or what is this area as well here of this kind of confined second ring. So this is this uh, algorithm we're using is this from uh, Will Perry, uh, the C2PO. And this is what is already available on the web page and you can see this immense improvement with the VH imagery where you can now observe the eye wall, observe the wind speed uh, in a non-saturated manner. And this is from the old channel and you can see that, uh, that you have a big improvement here. We are trying to explain some of this backscatter in a theoretical model, which I wanted to save you today uh, with Alex Soloviev, who looked at, into this uh, uh, roughness of the sea surface. So supposedly this is not coming from the rain, but from the spray on the sea surface, where you do no longer have brack waves, but these brack waves explode into a kind of spray, and that spray will then be uh, relevant for the respected backscatter. You can see here what's happening at 4 centimeter wavelengths, a bit larger than X-band, and at 10 centimeters you can see that this explosion happens much less, and uh, up to 30 centimeters we haven't got here. That was a CFD simulation. We didn't get uh, to the simulation yet. Okay. And uh, for radar set we got a respective image as well, a bit further to the west. And again, you can analyze now the radar set images with this ESA toolbox. This is an overlay, again, of the HH and VV, uh, VV and VH channels. You again can observe the eye and, and the shape here in VH very well. And you could, uh, we again, could calculate the wind field. So this is as well available now for all the radar set 2 imagery, which we got courtesy of MDA. I think they're quite different now. Again, this interesting structure here of the eye wall uh, would be something that, that could be better explained. We measured the size of the eye, got a diameter here of 70 kilometers from highest wind speed to highest wind speed in VH. And then, uh, of course, uh, supposedly, uh, the eye size from the NOAA is supposed to be a lot smaller. So again, uh, if you, I, I put in an eye size of 35, that would be uh, here, further measured more in the middle. So again, you have to be careful what you call an eye size from the top of the clouds or from the sea surface. And maybe I thought if we kind of put this together and measure the tilt, you could say something about the stability of the hurricane. I'm more of a remote sensor than a hurricane researcher. So now I come to my real topic. That was that you could observe the sea surface at such a high resolution that you observe the individual ocean waves. And if you do an FFT, you can see these two peaks, which is respectively the length. One over this would be respectively the length. And the energy under it would be the peak wavelength and the energy under it here would be related to the significant wave height. And there were very complicated transfer functions. If you observe these images, you could see the waves don't look like real waves, but a bit more like reflections in a swimming pool. You have some focusing due to the radar process and due to the moving waves. And there were some, co I, I, I spent a lot of my uh, research time on this, how to get the, from the image spectra, the true wave spectra. And now that we are in this neural network type of times, uh, we as well looked into some empirical algorithms. And what we are getting now is that we can not get the full two-dimensional spectrum by this method, but at least we can tune to wave height and mean period and get some empirical parameters out here under the hurricanes. 
and we tuned this algorithm, an empirical algorithm, over lots and lots of, of, of model data from Wayford 3 and validated it then over hundreds of buoys as you have to kind of download every single one image. That was quite a bit of work, but we got uh, here you can see a validation between HS, the measurement of the buoys. This is the North Sea buoys. We used some of the Hawaii and all of the NOAA buoys. And uh, this is the HS from Sentinel. And you get quite a, quite a reasonable here, an RMS of 0 0.8. And I think we had uh, over 1,000 entries here in this validation. And this is a bit of a better error analysis here. You can see here is zero error and then the distribution of errors around uh, significant wave height. Um, so this is, we have a load of sentinel images. I'm showing you one case when here was the land, when it was landfall here in Florida. So first it kind of, uh, Irma went westwards along the Cuban coast and then north. To the west coast was always um, said it would go to the east coast. So I kind of worried quite a bit about my friends. And uh, so when you, when you had, Sentinel covering this area here. You can see this is just the Wayforge 3 model and the wind model from just simply uh, this Earth website. We tuned the algorithm using this type of model that was in principle pretty easy with an empirical algorithm and you can read it here. You had 7.8 meters significant wave height and if you look at the results, so this is all the Sentinel images and here you can read the significant wave height. Uh, it's between, I need glasses. It, <laughs> it is between five, six, eight meters here. So this is the eye of Hurricane Irma, and uh, you can measure then the wave height, the significant wave height in an aerial sense under the hurricane. And that might be very nice to compare to wave models and tune, tune wave models too. As well as here south of Cuba, you still have some quite high waves. We did this for all the scenes and, and work is ongoing, so if you're a keen wave model, it might be interesting to compare. Last not least, we had all these Terra X acquisitions uh, over Irma, and there you see very strong, you can see the swath is very much more narrow, the resolution is very high, and this may be much more interesting to study coastal effects, as well the sea state, as, as well all the rain features, and I'm just going to show you two images now to leave you puzzled at the end of the session. I don't know what I see here. Maybe somebody has a very good idea. This is Cuba, this is the Bahamas. You see a wake, like behind a ship wake, and you can observe these kind of rain features so maybe it's a water spout and uh, this other image is to show you that again you can observe very nicely the refracting waves under the hurricane and all this waits to be analyzed. In summary, so we derive the wind speed from HV channels, uh, we overcome the saturation problem which is probably not an instrumental problem but uh, the, just the surface the scattering mechanisms uh, saturates at this um, we get different eye shapes in VV and VH channel, which may tell you a lot about the, the scattering there on the sea surface. We can have a lot of this data for free, and uh, the X-band data shows strong rain and sea surface features. And L-band is supposedly better at measuring in heavy rain, and uh, this is going to be launched. We're looking forward to that. Arlo's data available. I only saw from JAXA data after the hurricane, so to map the flooding. I didn't see ice, so maybe if that is available, I would be very interested. And NISA and Tandem L is two plans that is hopefully to come. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions? Okay. Well, thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you all for being part of this session and being part of the late breaking heavy session. And if any of you would like to chat with each other as well, the next session is not until four. So thank you again and I hope you guys have a great day.